First of all, um, welcome to all of you. Um, this webinar today um, is called The Shift Towards uh, Circular Fashion and Textile. Um, and this webinar is part of uh, the AMS webinar series um, that is growing day by day. Um, I, don't, I lost count, to be honest, how many webinars we already uh, set up during this crisis. I myself am uh, Ruud Rek. I work for Antwerp Management School as a researcher. Uh, and I will be your host for today. So I will uh, try to manage um, this webinar. So it is, it is a pleasant experience for all attendees to watch. Um, okay, first of all, let me mention that this webinar is more or less a follow-up of, of a webinar that we set up uh, end of May called uh, Fashion Post-Corona, where we uh, invited business leaders and experts to talk about uh, the future of their business um, in related to the crisis, of course, and uh, really discuss how to prepare your business for the next thing. Uh, of course, that was clear that sustainability is a very important element in this future. Um, and so we took on the task to set up an inspiring new webinar to really give an insight on what practitioners, current practitioners experience while taking on um, this circular uh, fashion uh, task. So we invited a group of designers um, to offer an insight on what they experienced uh, during their development of new um, circular fashion business cases. Uh, and this is a job that is still uh, really difficult um, to take on. It is a current uh, business. They are further developing, but still it is interesting to already offer some insights um, and give you some learnings uh, from their experience. Know that um, this webinar was made available um, by linking up with uh, the Top Atelier project. Um, I myself am a business coach inside of this project. Uh, and later on, Anne Corrier will explain this project further on and the reason why it was set up. Top Atelier was um, set up with uh, direct funding from Flanders Circular. So that means that we are um, supported by Flanders Circular to make the fashion industry in Flanders and in Belgium uh, more sustainable. First of all, before I go to the agenda of today, some practicalities. Um, we are going to use the chat function, so you will be able to ask any questions uh, to uh, the panelists, but we would like uh, you to not use the private uh, function, so it is able uh, for our, all participants to see all the questions. That is, uh, we, we have a huge favor for this approach, so uh, everyone can understand what is uh, discussed uh, in the back office. You can ask questions during the presentations. Uh, we will see how we can answer them. Some we can answer directly through the chat. Some we can take uh, with us to the Q&A sessions. If you are planning to, uh, to share some um, media, share some attention on social media, about this uh, webinar, please uh, try to mention Antwerp Management School, Top Atelier, and all the different speakers uh, that are involved today. Uh, that would be really nice uh, to see that happen. Um, last element to, to talk to you about is that um, this webinar will be record, record um, and it will be sent uh, to you by mail somewhere beginning of next week, so you can always look better with, back to it. All webinars AMS is uh, setting up we are still available through YouTube or through our own website, the Antwerp Management School website. Go and look at it um, if you're interested in more inspiration. Okay, so for the webinar of today, uh, again, I already mentioned we have a tight schedule, uh, lots of speakers for today. We get a time slot uh, of an hour and a half and inside of that time slot, um, we will first give the word to Rosanna, a colleague of mine, a researcher of mine, who will give a small introduction on the need to take that shift towards circular fashion and textile. Uh, and after that, we will give uh, Anne Collier the word. She's the project leader of the Top Atelier um, project. Um, and she will explain why Top Atelier is needed uh, and what's the main goal towards also the, the, the current confection industry in Belgium. Uh, and after that, after Anne's explanation on Top Atelier, we will show, uh, we will give all designers from Top Atelier the possibility to show their uh, project 
give you an insight on, on what they realized, but also on, on what they encountered. Um, and they all get um, 10 minutes of presentation time and we get a small uh, direct Q&A uh, linked uh, to that presentation. So a couple of minutes after every presentation, we can have a Q&A specifically on every designer's presentation. Um, but know that um, after the presentations, we will end the session with an open Q&A. How will it take uh, place? First of all, Tropas will present their cases, their case. Uh, after that, Lagadou will present Dan Tritik, Paul Joseph, Studio Ama. These are the five top atelier cases, really inspiring cases, also really nice uh, product and realizations you will see. Um, and after that, uh, we will give um, the word to Valerie Boutens. She will um, give an overview of which lessons can be learned from this specific pro project from Top Atelier that can be translated into the uh, broader fashion industry. Um, when Valerie is uh, finished, normally we will uh, be at around 3.20 and we will start our Q&A session. We'll take 10 minutes uh, of open Q&A. After um, 3.30, we will close the webinar, but the Q&A can still um, go on just through chat if needed. We will see uh, what happens uh, then. So um, that being said, that was my welcome. Uh, please enjoy this webinar. I will give the word to my colleague, uh, Rosanna. Yes, thank you. Okay, I'm unmuted. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. Uh, I am Rosanna Hensen. I am a researcher at the Sustainable Transformation Lab at the Antwerp Management School, and I am the author of the first uh, For Dummies book on the circular economy. And in the coming five or six minutes, uh, I will go deeper into the question why making the shift towards a circular uh, fashion industry is, uh, is so important. So, first of all, there are three reasons on why we need to make the shift towards a, a circular fashion industry. And the first reason is our dependence on other countries. Um, and we have covered this topic during our first uh, AMS fashion webinar, uh, where we talked about the impact uh, of the corona crisis on the industry. Because if this pandemic highlights one thing, it is that the fashion industry really relies too much on intercontinental supply chain. While in a circular economy, for example, the local production becomes far more important. So during this introduction, I will focus on the two other reasons, which are the impact on the climate and the growing demand for natural resources. So as you know, the textile and fashion industry is one of the most polluting industries of the world. Um, as an example, 20% of industrial water pollution globally comes from the dyeing and treatment of textiles. And besides, the industry is also known for poor working conditions, overproduction and its wasteful nature. Um, and in the current linear industry, take, make, use, waste is central. By 2030, the global population will be around 8.5 billion people, resulting in a growing demand for natural resources. And by then, the fashion consumption, so that's in 10 years, will have grown by 65%. So this has major impacts. For example, a 63% increase in energy emissions, a 50% a increase in label practices, and a 61 increase in waste creation. And of course, all these factors will negatively influence the environment and the communities living and working in the textile value chain. So, however, in a circular fashion industry, waste and pollution are already designed out in the start of the production process. So for this webinar, I'd like to zoom in on waste creation as Top Atelier uh, works with textile waste streams. Um, so let me see. According to Eurostat, each year in the European Union alone, we as consumers discard 2.29 billion kilograms of textiles. Um, that sounds like a very unprehensible number, so I created a little visual for you. This blue pile, that is the mountain of discarded textiles. That pile is equivalent to the weight of 760,000 elephants, which is more than the global elephant population today. And if you look all the way in the left corner, 
you see a tiny little dot and that is me or that is you that is us as humans so you can see how immensely big this textile waste mountain is and we do that every year in the european union alone so of that mountain 95 percent could be reused or recycled and if we look at the amount of materials used in the fashion industry the total amount we currently only recycle 13% in some way. And most of that is downcycled into, for example, insulation materials or wiping cloths. And even less, less than 1% is used to make new clothing. So that mountain shows that there is a huge amount of untapped potential in used textiles. And keeping these textiles in the loop and all these items and materials in use, so thus clothing their, closing their loop, is one of the key principles of a circular fashion industry. And to sum it up, so in a circular economy, we design out waste and pollution. We keep items, materials, and resources in use by closing the loop. And we switch to renewable energy and renewable resources. Therefore, we make the industry less dependent on intercontinental supply chain, we reduce the impact on climate, and we lower the demand for natural resources. But I would like to add one thing to that, because that is the social component. We as humans have to make this shift. So we as humans, in all, all sides of the textile supply chain, we should be valued just as much as all the other principles of the circular economy. And luckily, there are already a lot of great examples for that and a lot of circular strategies to achieve this. And today we will see uh, how some great companies do that. So I will now give the floor to Anne. Thank you very much. Um, Anne, you can take over the screen um, and explain why uh, Top Atelier uh, was set up and what its goal is, of course, uh, regarding to this textile waste uh, problem. Okay, thank you very much, Rosanna and Ru, for the invitation today. And uh, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Anne Collier, and I'm glad that we can present today uh, Top Atelier. And Top stands for uh, Textile Omschakelings Process, which means in uh, English, Textile Switching Process. Uh, and it's an upcycling uh, project. So this huge amount of uh, textile waste that uh, Rosanna was mentioning is our uh, source material in this uh, uh, project. So uh, we want to show that it can be uh, profitable, scalable and market friendly to make high quality products in Belgium out of textile waste streams. And, uh, Top Atelier is an initiative of EVOC, Duke VZW, ECOZO, Prospects Institute, and uh, Crea Moda by the support or, of uh, Flandre Circulaire. Uh, I do remember our uh, first meeting we had. We sat around the table with uh, all these uh, believers from different domains, and uh, we had a common goal, namely to raise the awareness and the importance of uh, circular economy among consumers, producers, and so on. So during this first meeting, we decided to submit this uh, project uh, together. In addition to these uh, founding members, we also have our supporting partners who work in, uh, uh, with us on assignment. And you can find uh, more about our partners and supporting partners on our websites and uh, socials. So upcycling seems to be successful, but it remains a challenge to make it a profitable model. Designers are depending on customization and uh, available materials uh, with a limit guarantee in terms of quality and volume. So with Top Atelier, we are looking for innovative sorting systems. We experiment with new techniques and technologies, and we test new possibilities in practice. We also cooperate um, and use the know-how and professionalism of the Belgian uh, industry. 
So as this project is limited in time, two years, and uh, limited in budget, we have to make specific choices. And that means uh, that we, um, especially for the sorting and the cutting process, which are the new issues. Uh, for example, uh, with Gerber technology, we um, developed a solution uh, for the cutting process, uh, starting from finished garment instead of uh, fabric rolls. And this week, uh, we cut 120 shirts to make uh, curtains of it. So the very uh, first questions we had at the beginning of this project were the following. What criteria are needed to guarantee a quality product? What adaptations are required to make sorting easier and better? What training is needed to guarantee a successful employment? Which labels should we use in upcycled clothing? Which technology uh, should we use for sustainable reuse? Are we able to start cutting from uh, finished clothing? What is a sustainable uh, circular business model? And how can we involve the consumer in uh, this story. So uh, the answers and the lessons learned will be shared at the end of this uh, webinar, like uh, Rule told us. And um, we also need attractive and scalable uh, designs of high, high quality. And therefore, we launched an open call for designers in January of 2019 and we selected uh, five designer brands. Now, what uh, does uh, Top Atelier for those designers? So, um, Ecoso Kringwinkels, they uh, collect the sorting material. Uh, Duke VZW provided uh, coaching and organizes uh, collective wisdom sessions. Crea Moda, uh, dispose Drawy, the platform to protect your designs and give us information about labeling. Uh, Prospects Institute provided consumer uh, feedback. Josefa assisted with uh, coaching and uh, Evoc organized trainings on different domains. We also provide coaching and we connect the designers with the fashion industry. So um, they are five um, different stories, um, the designers, and uh, that they are linked by passion, faith, and hard work. So we are proud to present them to you, uh, Paul Josefa, Lagadoui, Studio Ama, Triptyque, and Tropas. So thank you for listening and enjoy the rest of the webinar. Thank you, Anne. Um, I'm sorry to see that some people experience some problems with sound. Um, I have the idea that at this point it is a Zoom problem that we cannot uh, fix. So keep in mind that we will offer the video later on through YouTube. Um, so now let's go to the, the, the inspiring cases, the inspiring design and, and business cases. Uh, and for that, uh, I give the word to the first designer, uh, Caro. Um, she will be presenting the Tropas case. Carol, you can take over. Thank you. So today I'm going to talk about not those beautiful legs you see here, but it's all about shoes. Um, as already um, Rosanna and Anne were talking about, um, one of the first major topics we are talking about today is uh, the post-consumer textile um, we have. So in Central Europe, we shop and we drop. Um, Rosanna already showed the numbers, so I'm not going to talk more about that. But that's the first major topic for me in which I try to design and create something. So the um, huge amount of post-consumer textile waste. Then the second um, topic is that most products um, around us, not only shoes or fashion, are designed uh, without thinking about a second life. 
So most of the designers, they think about what do we like or what will sell, but not what is going to happen with this product after its life. So that happens also specifically with shoes. Shoes are not designed for this assembly or for a second life. And uh, we use a lot of different materials in shoes, a lot of different layers, and they're all stuck together with permanent glue. Um, that makes shoes a waste item after use. So they, most of the shoes end up in landfills or get burned. So that's the second topic. Third topic is that uh, fair and sustainable fashion are not accessible. Why are they not accessible? Um, because the price is higher. Uh, some people can think it's too expensive or it's not correct, but uh, that is also due to the fact that we are brainwashed by fast fashion. We think that the prices that what we pay today for a pair of shoes or for a t-shirt is a normal price. And we don't know or um, what work is needed to make a pair of shoes, for example. Uh, so there is a lack of knowledge on the true work and the true cost of something. And if uh, you start getting interested in it, you have to beware about greenwashing. So there is a lot to ask from uh, the consumer uh, to be very critical. So that is the situation today for me. Then what do we do or where do we believe in? Uh, two things actually. So it's all about circles since we are a circ circular fashion brand. So at one hand we close a circle and at the other hand we break a circle. So the, the closing the circle is about product level. So actually we reuse uh, post-consumer waste. Spe more specifically, we uh, used uh, denim for the first collections. Um, instead of creating a new material, using new raw materials, harvesting new cotton and so on, creating new textiles, we use what is available uh, around us. And the nice added value is that the material designs, uh, defines the design and not the other way around. Usually the designer starts from its imagination and chooses a material that goes with that imagination and we turn it around. Um, then uh, we, we really think about every aspect of the shoe when we design it. So there, we try to use as less as different kind of materials, so which uh, enables the disassembling and the reusing afterwards. And we don't use toxic glue or permanent glue. So our shoes are designed for a second life and to disassemble. We reuse every part of it after uh, the shoes are worn out. That's the first thing about the, to close the circle on a product level. Then we break the circle on a social level. So what do we do? In first hand, we don't exploit. We offer correct working conditions on, and fair wages. And where we can, we work together with social enterprises. So we know who works with us and in which conditions. And this is very important for us. Um, that's the first step. The second step is that we are really on a mission to, democrat to democratize fair and sustainable fashion. So we think fair and sustainable fashion should not be a niche, nice to have product for some hipsters but we want to have a big impact and to really change the model. Uh, it also breaks my heart if I see that people collaborating in this project, like cutting the denim, for example, are not able to buy a pair of shoes and they worked, they collaborated on a part of it. So that made us think that we should really change the model. We should, um, um, I think what I want to say is that if we keep on going with this fast fashion model and we think it's normal that we can buy a pair of shoes for uh, the price of a lunch or a t-shirt for the price of a coffee, then we maintain a system that exploits people and it's the people with uh, low wages or a low budget that still keep buying 
uh, low quality products. So from this side of the world, when we shop in Primark, for example, we maintain a system of exploitation in the other side of the world. And it's most, not uh, all of them, but most of the people here with a low budget maintain of help maintain a system where people in an, the other part of the world with a low budget are uh, abused. So I don't think we should lower the price of our products because our product has a correct price, but we should, we are really on a mission to look for other ways to buy shoes in order to make them accessible for everyone. That's my point. I hope it's clear. Sorry, I lost uh, my thing. Okay, on the product level, I just made a little infographic. So actually, we reuse post-consumer jeans. It's washed and uh, collected and cut in social workplaces. Um, then, as you can see, we add no glue to it. So it's only stitched or uh, with spikes attached to the upper to the outsole, which makes it easy. Uh, to disassemble and doesn't break up all the materials when disassembling and we reuse every part of it. So mainly the textile is uh, shredded and used as isolation material. The wood of the high heels and the heels is uh, used to make furniture design, uh, designer furniture and the rubber is shredded, the rubber of the sneakers, the outsole is shredded and reused in new outsoles. So then what do you get with Tropas? So we offer elegant designer shoes uh, that, that are produced in a socially and ecological, ecologically sustainable way at a fair price. So our price is correct uh, and we can totally explain our price to the consumer. We are transparent on that. Um, as an added value, um, the Tropas customers are actually part of a Tropas tribe of a community. Tropas is also the Spanish word for troops. And we see our people wearing our shoes, not as customers, but more as people wanting to change the world together with us and making the world more beautiful. Um, also, you can, be, you can have a peace of mind if you buy Tropas, you're sure that there is no blood, no tears, no child labor involved, and that you will not leave any waste when you don't need the shoes anymore, because we take them back. That was it. So, <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, Carol, we have... Okay, I will stop a bit of time. A bit of time for some questions. Okay. One uh, question. <laughs> that really pops up uh, is, what is a fair price for a pair of sneakers? Yes, the price we have now, uh, we sell the price, um, we sell the sneakers at 179 euros in shops. And that is because we have a very small production, very local production where everybody gets the right cut. Okay. And that's clear also that um, on the level of price, you are not going to make any compromises. Uh, but regarding to scaling, um, you will still have to see in the near future how it will evolve, right? Yes, yes. There was another question, uh, a general question that could maybe also be answered by, uh, by Anne from Evoc. Um, and the question was how to bring transparency to the working conditions and fair wages beyond working with social enterprises. Complex question. Uh, maybe it's too complex, Carol, just to, to just uh, put on your table. No, um, for me at this stage, it's easy because I, I'm still so small that I see everything in the process by my own eyes. But if you have a way bigger production, then you have to trust all the people that are in between. And then you, you don't see every step and every working condition with your own eyes. So I think that's maybe a challenge okay. in the future by upscaling. And then a, a last detailed question. Um, do you reuse the textile um, that is used in Tropas shoes? Yes, so we start from uh, denim pants we make shoes out of it and then after it 
afterwards when the, the shoes are worn out and we, we get them back, then we, um, the textile is shredded and used as isolation material. So this is actually downscaling, but we did the upscaling before, so I think it's still okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Carol. Uh, no problem that uh, you lost track. It's uh, <laughs> every, everybody uh, gets that at one point. So okay. you made your point uh, and you showed your uh, concept and it's clear uh, what okay. the added value is, of course. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's go over to the next um, yeah, couple of designers, uh, duo of designers, uh, like Adui, um, Eloise and Audrey. Um, you can take over the screen. So why we started project? with Eloise or Bob designers, and it's now denied to create new products. But we always had a bad feeling that the way things are done is not good. So we know we must do something to change our habits. It's about consuming less, or maybe it's just about consuming better. The clothing industry is now the second most polluting industry on the planet, for all the reasons, say, Jorzan and Caro before. And in Europe, we know a person throws an average 10 kilos of clothes by year, and American 30 kilos. So we wonder, what do we do with all these textiles, clothes, not wanted anymore? As designer, we never miss ideas about what we could do with this textile left. In fact, we don't see this textile as a waste, but as a resource. We love make prototypes ourselves, but how to scale up this sample to production? This is a question we have been through, this process, and it's where with Top Atelier we could get answer. This is how we come to upgrade project. So um, as we've seen before, like we um, uh, we've decided to uh, to take some of the of the garment from that uh, that waste, so to take that out from the actual system that either um, reuse, resells, recycles uh, the garments, but most of it most of it is still uh, going directly to the incinerator. So what we do, we like take this uh, garment. From the from the waste stream and decide to give it a new life, and so we've uh, we found a, a system to to like uh, disassemble the clothes and by cutting them into reg uh, regular shapes, we can then assemble them again into a new piece of textile uh, for the interior. So it all starts with the the source of material. We've decided to work with only one kind which is men's shirt. We've chosen that because they are quite uh, standard, they have a nice feel, a nice quality, and we were especially attracted to their colors. So this is our uh, color palette for creating uh, new items. So the first step is the sorting process, and we've experienced that it's already quite a challenge, like from the raw material to, to uh, manage to get it sorted so then we can work with it. So the first, uh, the second step that we've been working on is the cutting process. And we've, um, it's, it could seem easy, but it was uh, quite uh, also tricky to find out the, the, best, uh, the best way to reuse the shirts and uh, finding the placement of the pattern. So it's, it's uh, a balance between the how to reuse most of the fabric and still uh, how to be efficient in the production and how to, to save time. And the first uh, outcome we got because we were uh, really attracted to these fabrics and to their nice transparency and we, we thought of uh, making uh, curtains. So we've made a series of curtains, blinds and dividers based on this repetition of rectangles. And here is the second, uh, second outcome. Uh, it's a plaid, also made on the repetition of one uh, single uh, pattern, but then it's been uh, doubled. And uh, in the second step, after we had cut all the, um, all the pieces, uh, all the rectangles, we were still left with piles of leftovers and they were really like graphical um, elements with shapes and colors and we've decided to use them again and um, we've found a, another technique for that which is quilting. So we've uh, teamed up with um, uh, a Belgian uh, industry, a company 
called Indica de Pau. And uh, they are specialized in industrial quilting. And uh, what, they, what their uh, usual business is, uh, they work for making uh, coffins and carnival fabrics. So they were also quite intrigued to see, uh, to see us uh, bringing a new idea, a new product and opening a, another sector for them. And on our side, we were really um, happy to, to uh, benefit from their knowledge and uh, technology. So that's the first uh, collection we've made uh, with this technique. So it's a collection of plates and, uh, and pillows for the interior. So they are all unique and we compose uh, each piece from what we have and, uh, and also from our uh, uh, intuition. So they, they are really like uh, composed like paintings. And, uh, and they're also uh, meant for a nomad living because they are quite flexible in use and you can like carry them with you and, uh, and keep them for, for long. And uh, the last uh, part of the project, so next to, to thinking of, uh, of making products for the end consumer, we've also realized that we had developed skills uh, and techniques that can be applied to several projects. And, um, and we got a commission by On the Talbar that you're going to hear uh, later in this presentation to make uh, this curtain for an uh, art center uh, in Ostend. And so they were looking for um, a nice background to put it, uh, in, in this place. And so we could uh, make um, a specific curtain from our shirts and that's inspired from, uh, from this place. And to go even further, uh, like we had this uh, case study on the shirts, but we realized it's a, a technique we can apply to several uh, kind of, uh, of waste materials. And uh, so here is a second project we've made uh, commissioned by On the Talba and Studio Helder. And it's again a huge uh, curtain for a um, uh, music, music uh, center. And this one was made from uh, industrial uh, leftovers from the, from the entertainment uh, fabric uh, industry. And the latest project uh, to be made in the, in the coming month, uh, we've, um, we've got a call for project in our commune in uh, Anderlecht. And it's, it's going to be a, a textile installation uh, that is, uh, is, will be uh, hanged to, to signal a new area in the neighborhood. So it was really inspired by that place, uh, which is a, a former port. So it's a really, uh, it has a, this uh, seaside feeling. And uh, as it's an outdoor installation, we had to look for the right material and uh, we could um, uh, team up with the um, camp to camp that reuses the tents uh, left after the Tomorrowland Festival. And so we, we are working from the left and broken tents and uh, we will cut them uh, in, this, uh, in this banner. And then the, another interesting side of that project is that it's uh, participative. So we are going to um, invite people from the, this neighborhood to, uh, to produce it with us. And that's also a really interesting way for us to um, to communicate about upcycling, what it is and how much work it is and what kind of new results we could get. So that's a nice uh, discussion. Piece. So it's difficult to make a conclusion because we are just at the beginning. We see a lot of possibilities for the one who deals with the second end textile, like the sorting center, but also for traditional textile industries who want to make a twist and imagine a new way to work, adapt their machine to new use, for example, and of course for the designers. We hope it's inspiring for you and we are open to new collaboration. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Eloise and Audrey. Um, I had a specific uh, question that popped up here. Um, how hard is it to find the right colors and material for your curtains, for your beautiful curtains? Oh, difficult to find the right colors, you said? The right colors, yeah, because they are, everyone is really impressed about 
a combination of colors. Does it take a lot of time? How do you approach this problem of finding the exact correct combination of colors? Like, um, it's about getting enough material first in the starting point. So we need to collect enough and then we are also still able to make a selection. But like surprisingly, we always mm. got um, interesting colors and like we can't really predict, but from what we get, we find the right. So it's more about harmony and the combinations of colors that work well. Yeah, and it's always custom made. It's, it's no mass production, of course. And that will lead us to the next question. Um, what about the, the retail price, uh, wholesale prices for curtains? Um, how do you uh, cope with that? That's a business model question. I can also help in answering this, but first I want to uh, hear your answer on this one. Yeah, we like we we are still in the prototyping phase, so we don't have a, a, a price made yet. So there are still some elements that have to be defined. But yeah. of course, it's going to be a high-end product because of all the the steps, all the work that's uh, in it. So we yeah, definitely. I'm going to add to, to your answer also, because I saw some questions about, okay, um, what are prices for specific target groups? The essence of, of what you are doing right now is developing a prototype and a product linked to a business model. And that means if you develop a business model, you have to choose uh, what is your target group. And the target group that you are aiming at isn't the target group that is only deciding on price. Uh, it has to be a target group that uh, falls in love with a product and where price isn't an issue. And that's typical for a custom made, of course, that you go to a much more high-end or a more project-based uh, target group and don't focus on the mass market. So the retail price and the wholesale price of curtains isn't really that big of an issue then. We'll see. I think it's time to move to the to the next uh, designer to go to the next designer. So I will give the word to uh, Triptik. Um, please, Verle and Sophie, you can take over uh, the screen. Um, good afternoon. Uh, we like to present you Triptik. My name is Verle Tijdgat, and I'm a textile designer. And my work always includes an ecological aspect like working with uh, natural dye or experimenting with uh, recycled material. And I place my work in the field of interior design. My name is Sophie. Um, I founded in 2012 on Betaalbaar, best translated as Priceless. It's a think tank, a research and workplace. We all start by working with waste. Um, um, the waste is not the, the we, do, we don't only do it because of ecological motivation, but it also has a strong emotional story. Each object we make has its own passport and in the passport you can find the origin of the materials, also uh, what happened in the atelier, um, the economical aspects, everything has, uh, is written in the passport as a kind of identity kit. Um, we started more in the artistic field, so the cultural um, activities, but now we are evolving more towards prototyping and doing interior designs. Um, we try to connect care, education, social work, um, but also work in the more commercial sector and even the private sector. Um, I think in our projects, the reuse is not always seen in the first impression. It has a certain twist. Um, we don't always take the easiest way, uh, but we try to make it all still playful. Triptyque is actually our second collaboration and our first collaboration, Multiple Choices. We gave discarded school chairs a second life by wrapping them with a knitted cover made of recycled jeans yarn. And for Triptyque, we want to recycle leather. And first we start collecting leather at the crink shop and we could find the biggest part of leather in the back of the sofas. Um, but uh, this is also the only part uh, of leather that has not deformed yet. But collecting this leather was quite hard and we were also not sure about the quality of the leather. So we decided not only to focus on this post-consumer waste, but also used post-production leather from a belt factory and a furniture factory. 
Um, and here we're really sure about the quality, also about the color fastness. We have also a wider range of colors. Um, the leather from the belt factory is also double-sided. And the biggest advantage is that these factories have their, cut, have their own cutting system, so we can collect and cut at the same place. To use as much as possible from the leather, um, we cut the leftover from the cow skin or the sofa in fine strips. And based on a traditional weaving technique, kaneren, um, we designed an open and a closed woven structure. And because we actually like the backside, the downside of the leather, we use the backside as the good side. And like this, we are very proud to present our first triptych family, our first prototypes. To start with, we have the chair. The chair is an example of the closed um, weaving um, structure system. Um, it is, uh, we use light colors of leather um, and the wood is left over multiplex from the atelier or also from the place where we cut it, the CNC place. Um, since we use different types of multiplex, we pickle them in dark brown or black uh, as preferred. Um, a second example is the bar stool. The bar stool also has a seating in the closed weaving structure. Um, it has a small benched back for seating comfort. And um, here we don't use the multiplex as wood, but it's uh, hardwood. Um, yeah, and then we have a third option, which is a, a flexible uh, piece of furniture. It's either a sitting element, if you put a soft top uh, on top, and then you can switch it and then the hard side is on top and it can be a side table. Um, then we had some um, yeah, research for more open structure uh, systems. So we came up with the cupboard. The cupboard has, um, the doors of the cupboard are woven. Um, they are see-through. And if you open the door, you can see the backside of the ladder. And the benefit of the cupboard is that we can use inferior qualities of leather because there's no strength needed uh, on the doors. Um, the, the leather there has an aesthetical uh, function. Um, the paravent is actually, uh, yeah, it's three parts, a bit the same as a cupboard, but uh, another um, a function. And then the last option is a set of uh, sound panels. Here you also have the open structure, so the sound can go through the holes in between uh, the ladder and is captivated in the acoustic filling. The acoustic filling uh, is made out of recycled PET bottles or um, shredded molten. And these two options are uh, made by Showtex. Um, they, they have a, a decent quality, so we, can sure, we are sure that we can offer uh, a good uh, sound uh, acoustic uh, um, reference. Uh, and because we also had like leftovers from all the leftovers, we experimented with a matelassage technique. So small pieces of leather are stitched together so it becomes a new fabric and we can use this also for seat furniture and upholstery. And then we made um, a second example of a chair with a more bench back for even more uh, seating comfort. And this is like the perfect combination with the matelassage technique we previous uh, talked about. If you think about possible uh, applications for our designs, we first think about B2B, like public spaces like a bar or a restaurant, a lounge, or it can also be nice in a clothing shop in the dressing room or it can be used in a waiting room entrance in a museum. Um, the room dividers can be used in an office or in the meeting room. You can also take them home. So for instance, the cupboard can be uh, at your place in the bedroom. It can be the backside of the bed, a room divider in the living room or a bar stool. Uh, so e even the B2C market is um, within reach, we hope. Until now, uh, Leder Rijn is a leather company here in Ghent um, who did the cutting. And we collected leather at Blue Star and um, Durlet. But we have the aim to collaborate with more pa partners who can uh, deliver the leather. Um, if we think about the production of the weaving and the upholstery, we want to work with social workplaces like Kunig or Weerwerk. And for the wood, Gram Design did the CNC cutting. Um, for now, we would like to present um, our first prototypes on uh, fairs like contemporary design markets, 
uh, maybe Belgian art and design, um, interior Kortrijk. But apart from the fairs, I think it would be good if we could join other partners to spread the ideology um, around our prototypes. We also did a first rough pricing. And um, since it's still a lot of handwork and craftsmanship in our prototypes, um, I think we need to spend uh, 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 good time in making an accurate uh, business plan um, to be able to reach a, a, a broader market. And for now, we are already very happy that we can integrate the prototypes in a very uh, big project uh, called Circuit in New Zuid in Antwerp. Um, we do the total uh, design of the cellar and the ground floor. It is going to be a house where there's a perfect marriage in between reuse and upcycling. So this is the perfect setting for circular designs. Um, not only ours, but also others. Um, Helen? So this is our uh, family triptych until now. And actually we have the aim not to grow uh, bigger, but to grow better. Uh, so we like to improve uh, our designs and we're open for more collaborations with other designers or other partners. Um, so thank you for listening. And we also want to thank our partners who made the story so far. Okay, stop sharing. Yeah. Thank you, Vera Sophie. Um, thanks for the presentation and for the nice graphics also, of course. Um, on general, um, there are no specific questions to your presentation, um, but um, I think on the level of, of business model, um, you didn't emphasize uh, the actions that you took, but what you could, you could see already is that there's a clear um, difference between going towards consumer market vs going to B2B. Um, maybe you can answer uh, what you experienced there um, and, and what you think that means for the near future. I think if we, if we want to make the prototypes and improve them, um, I think we need strong partnerships. And then um, I think the, the, the easiest way or the more convenient way would be to have partners um, who have like a general um, interior design. So we can work together to improve uh, the prototypes and to integrate them in a bigger picture. Because if we want to do this first for the private markets or all our furniture will be too expensive. So what we really hope is that we can go to a healthy production process um, and then could uh, be able that the, the objects are not too pricey for even you and me uh, to buy it ourselves. But I think we should start with B2B uh, and have a bigger story and uh, support to start with. And then hope, hopefully we will be able to, uh, to present not too expensive furniture because of course, this is uh, yeah, very important too. And then another uh, specific technical question that I know that you were uh, that you already focused on, but um, do you do do you check the leather sofas um, for uh, chromium and health issues uh, because it is uh, waste? Uh, we saw from experience that um, there's like a gray zone on uh, on quality, uh, but you worked on that, right? Mm -hmm. So there's, um, that's why actually we decided um, to switch to the post-production uh, because there we're really sure about the quality and then you, you, we know where the leather comes from and uh, the leather in the, um, the crimp shop, we can kind of test it, but uh, there's a, like a simple rubbing test and you can uh, test like the color uh, fastness. Um, but yeah, in the crimp winkle, we're really not sure about this. So the post-production leather is really like the best leather or the most healthy leather. Yeah, that's the way that you had to approach it yeah. to prevent yeah. getting in trouble on, on this yeah. flight. Um, a, a final small question. Um, uh, is there an, um, an end to life plan for these products? And I think this is also related to your, your um, business model research, maybe towards servicing and not selling products, of course. You already have some kind of vision on, on this end to life approach? Um, end of life, sorry. Now we only have wood and the leather. So, um, yeah, 
the, the it can also only like you can't use the wood afterwards for something else so that the, it can't be really recycled so it's just it, it's but it's still organic material so it would go in the normal way as other furniture things are but it's not uh, mdf or the yeah the um, i don't know together <laughs> it's yeah. also we, we don't use any glue so the leather and the wood can be perfectly separated afterwards so you have again like two different materials okay thanks time to go to the uh, next uh, duo of designers uh, i give the word to paul joseph uh, Hanna and tini you can take over the screen yes hey we are Hanna and tini uh, we started our clothing brand uh, Paul Joseph in the summer of 2019 uh, after Hannah moved back to Belgium. Uh, so I graduated in 2018 in fashion design and then I moved to London uh, to start working as a trainee designer at Alexander McQueen. Um, but there I noticed that the fast-paced fashion environment was not really the right place for me. Uh, so I decided to move back to Belgium. Uh, to work on my own terms and at that time I discovered the open call from Top Atelier uh, who was looking for designers to make high quality products in Belgium from textile waste streams. So I immediately started to turn uh, my ideas into the first prototypes and that later on became the starting point for Paul Joseph. And then I met Tini who had to photograph these clothes for uh, a magazine and we immediately bonded having lots of conversations and meetings about uh, fashion and the industry. And we discovered that we had a lot of the same values and also a love for sincerity. Actually, uh, it was not really our intention to start a clothing brand, another clothing brand. We didn't want to create war in an already over-consuming environment. But seeing this abundance of clothing, we also saw the potential of making these clothes valuable and wanted again giving it a new purpose. So with that idea in mind, uh, we suddenly could see a clothing brand that did fit with our values. Um, embroidery is the common thread uh, running through our garments. We draw every illustration by hand before transforming them um, into embroideries. And we developed a technique that is a very recognizable Paul Joseph by using the embroidery machine in a different way and um, so everything we make is upcycled and this means all garments and fabrics that we use are left over or second hand uh, and thanks to the technique of embroidery we can also use high quality shirts that became unwanted for example through a tough stain or a small hole at the moment our main focus is shirts uh, through top atelier we can collaborate with ecoso ecoso that is a group of eight shops called clean Lope here in belgium uh, kind of like thrift shops where we carefully select secondhand men's shirts and we deconstruct them to recreate new shirts for men and women uh, using all kinds of different techniques. For example, an extra large men's shirt can become a one size women's shirt. Uh, because of the changing availability, every garment is one of a kind, which is, we think, definitely a strength in times of mass production. Uh, we try to reform the shirt in a way that you also can change it to the uh, you can change the fit um, to your own body. That way, a shirt can cover different sizes. We really love the idea of a shirt because it is a classic and, and timeless garment. We choose not to work with uh, seasons or sales because creation takes time and does not necessarily move along to a repetitive cycle. Uh, so out of this, it was obvious that we wanted to create um, timeless garments, a garment that is not bound by a specific time, place, generation, profession, personality. Um, and this is something that we appreciate a lot, having a wide audience, um, because at the moment we've had customers from 14 years old up to 85 years old. So they obviously have all very different aesthetics, but that makes it very special to us. We also think it's uh, really important to create a moment uh, during which the customer is able to connect with our clothes and concept in real life. That's why we organize um, a physical Paul Joseph store several times a year, as well as a showroom that you can visit by appointment. 
in July we will have uh, a pop-up in Ghent at the uh, Ghent-based store Anya Zamoris. And later this summer we will also organize other positive stores in Ostend and Brussels. So everything is handmade in our atelier at the countryside near Brussels. Um, because we feel very much connected to, um, to the place we're working from, surrounding by the fields and the forests, and get inspired by the colors and textures surrounding us on a daily basis. But even the act of upcycling itself uh, is an inspiration, because upcycling means intervening, reinventing the way we make things. It's not about using waste, it's about just not treating it as waste. At this point, what might be considered useless or old is ready to be given a new life and purpose and to become a valuable item. Timeless clothing, like we want to bring timeless clothing that lasts beyond trends. Yeah, the act of upcycling uh, gives way to new forms of creativity and can really become a mode of thought, uh, a way of thinking. And this is what we hope to do with Paul Joseph. Uh, we want to expand our collection with different garments like trousers and skirts and some accessories. So all with the same idea of using unwanted secondhand material uh, and also focus further on embroidery. Uh, through Top Atelier, we realized that the profitable and scalable part isn't easy as, at all because we discover new challenges every day. But we hope that just step by step, uh, we can create our own system and rhythm, but within the bigger system. We are also looking to contact retail points around the world, working with stores that we feel, feel connected to, but don't necessarily only represent sustainable brands. That's a, a way, to, way to challenge the industry from within, so that even customers that aren't engaged in sustainability also could get, discover our brand and feel a connection to it and also to the idea of upcycling. Uh, we hope that upcycling can, in general, become, uh, become, can become a norm in the future. Okay, thank you for listening. Uh, if you want to get in touch with us, you can always contact us through email or telephone. Um, yeah, we had... <laughs> we, can, we can be <laughs> on the chat it. because it's not on the PowerPoint anymore. <laughs> uh, um, I, I suggest that uh, we can share the presentation itself also, uh, if you're okay with that. We can discuss this later on with all the designers, so all the presentations can be shared, uh, knowing that uh, on the level of intellectual property, of course, these presentations and these designs are yours, so they have to be treated with the respect uh, in the current rules regarding to uh, intellectual property, of course. Um, one question that popped up, um, how to approach the markets? What is the way that you are currently approaching clients? How can you reach clients right now? At the moment, we reach most of our clients uh, through Instagram. Um, we get a lot of messages from Instagram, and that's why where our cl um, client base is growing. Uh, we also launched today our websites, just like one hour before the pitch. Uh, so we hope that through the websites, we mm. can maybe uh, have some more attention in press. Uh, but mostly all questions at the moment uh, and clients we find through in Instagram. So we, we uh, take great importance to uh, the photography of our products. Um, so mm -hmm. we think it's very important. Yeah, and then, and then when they ask us um, on, on Instagram questions, then they can also give their um, email address and then we send sometimes newsletters when we, get, when we do new events or sales or then we have a, a, a mailing list. So that also means currently almost no marketing costs, but traction <laughs> on an underground level through your Instagram, yeah. uh, mouth by mouth, I would say. I, uh, people uh, get to know your product, connect with others and uh, come to you and you don't have to push your message towards them. Yeah, I think yeah. so. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, maybe it's a, a small, uh, small question on the embroidery. Um, uh, do you do it all by yourself or do you rely on others and what for the near future? So for now we do it all by, my, by ourselves. Um, we have a very small embroidery machine where we do, but that's also actually I think how we discovered our way of embroidery because it's not a super fancy embroidery machine. So through experimenting with the things that we have, we came to a, a, a very specific aesthetic. So that's quite difficult indeed to find um, 
people who can do the same kind of embroidery, um, but then on a, on a bigger scale, because sometimes it's um, a different um, set up in the, in the tension of the thread or things that people have to be willing to do, of course, mm. people who but are like- At the moment, we are already talking to some uh, persons for, for a further production. Mm -hmm. uh, and we are discussing if it's possible, uh, that we're still looking for yeah. somebody uh, for the production for the embroideries. Okay, I think uh, it's, it's best for you guys to just check the chat, some uh, inspiring links you can uh, connect with, um, but also post your, um, your current website on the chat so everyone can, can go. To yeah, the, but now uh, we can't, like, it's stuck, so we can't even do the chat with... Ah, your computer is really... Yeah, everything is stuck except like the video. <laughs> except Zoom, okay. Yeah. Just keep it that way so we can ask some questions later on. Uh, but uh, <laughs> we will see how to... Uh, send out all the presentations and the link to the website will be available in the presentation also, right? Okay, thank okay, you. Thanks a lot. Okay, thanks. Uh, so, time for the last um, designer, I think. Um, let me see, where are we? Yeah, Studio Ama and Soraya, that's the last one. Soraya, please take over uh, the screen. Um, so, uh, thank you, Rul, for the introduction. My name is Soraya. I am the founder of Studio Ama. Uh, I come from a Taylor's family. This, this is uh, the, the ribbon my uh, PP used in his clothing. Uh, so, fashion and fabrics were always there. Um, I am a maker at heart. And uh, I, I didn't intend it to, but I did study fashion uh, in, at La Cambre in Brussels. Uh, I gained some experience in, in uh, high-end fashion, but also in mass production, textile and fashion industry. Um, this is a very ugly slide um, to maybe summarize all the bad things that have been said um, about this industry. But it was also the discovery for me um, about my desire for change in this area. Um, so I started Studio AMA as a label for ethical fashion um, around these wildly discussed themes. Uh, for me, this was really an evidence. Uh, it was my goal to start small and independent to further initiate transition. Uh, in a hands-on way, because it's in, in industry, it's very hard to make big, big changes. So doing it on my, on my own seemed to be the way to go. Um, also the way to go to explore and change by example. I started um, with using post-production waste. I had one supplier um, and that was like a way to to do upcycling to, to get circular without value loss. And I have I still have a partnership with a social workshop, uh, also close by to Ghent. Um, and that's a bit where the magic happens, like the design by the possibilities that are available, that are available, so the limitations of the work of the waste streams and the capacities in the social workshop. Uh, I try to be as transparent as possible. I do all these things in a short chain so people can really make informed choices. I guess um, that those being informed um, leads to making better decisions and responsible choices. Uh, also, I am super open about all these processes and our um, visits to factory on for instance instagram on the stories and uh, we also got some press coverage uh, about our story um, and we try to spread this these uh, ideas to really build new conven conventions in the fashion industry for this um, collection for this season we also decontextualized um, textile from the textile industry, but there's also the Top Atelier project where we, where, where also Studio AMA is working with men's shirts. Um, like we work, so we work with the men's shirts, but also for instance, with upholstery fabrics and even towels. So it's really about what is this waste looking like and what can we do with it? 
Um, with Top Atelier, there is the introduction of post-consumer waste. For, so for us, this was like a new challenge uh, to take on, a very important one. I'm very grateful to have dived into it. Um, for the sorting criteria, uh, we talked about it a bit before, we chose to go for these blue greenish colors and to have uh, stripes and plain shirts to like as an idea to make like a real family for uh, the collection. We chose to work with existing coats on the shirts so to not cut the colors or the cuffs away to make them recognizable because uh, yeah, these are also to, to really br bring these classic elements into our designs. Um, this asks us to really fully understand uh, the, the materials we're working with. I think this is very key in circularity that you understand your materials, your sources, because they really are the base for your design. You have to fully comprehend them, uh, know their assets and their advantages. We are working not with patterns, but, what, but with guidelines. This is also in order to avoid waste and to take uh, original aspects into our designs. We approach the shirts as they were a puzzle and we are going to make reinterpretations of the coats of the, the, coats of the shirts in our new designs. Uh, in this uh, phase, we finished three designs. This is the first one. It's a skirt and it's called Oscar. Um, and you can recognize the color as the waistband and the double shoulder piece is also they both like carry the piece so it is still within the logic of the shirt that we took in account in the skirt shirt skirt this was like a tongue twister um we also made this um, adaptable in size. It's a smart intervention to make it um, accessible for more types of bodies. Um, this is Tango. It's the second design. You can recognize the sleeves as um, the skirt, the, like the original sleeves became the skirt. Uh, you also see that uh, every Tango is unique because we are starting from this from the shirt, so it takes like the visual aspects from the shirt with it. So yes, indeed, here also uh, unique pièces uniques um, in our collection. Also for this design, um, you can adapt the size in the waistband. So every like the the original buttons uh, buttons of the cuffs can be like you can adapt the size. This is the last one. It is called Papa. Um, we are using the Navo alphabet to give our uh, collection a name. Uh, here you can like think that the, um, I, I, I wear this dress, um, that, that the cuffs are like an embellishment and are at first sight are like an embellishment, like decorative. But uh, in fact, this also is a smart placement of where to put these cuffs because the um, folds, they function as darts. So we are really going to reorganize the assets of the original shirt. Now uh, we have um, this collection in pre-sale because, uh, because of the COVID we didn't do our full production yet. Uh, but these pieces are in pre-sale. They are called um, Papa Oscar Tango because we use the Navo alphabet and we didn't know bef by beforehand, but it means stop if you take the first letters. I think that was incredible. It was really by accident. Uh, for now, um, we are really making the, we are designing processes for scale. So a big challenge is to put the shirts for a new piece together. In one piece, there's normally two or three shirts. Uh, they have to like fit together. The buttons need to be in the right um, measurements away from each other. Um, this is a very time consuming thing. Uh, th th therefore, I think it's a very good that I was also already in this uh, social workplaces. Um, there's um, really the desire to explore more type of um, textile, more type of materials in these post-production um, streams, for instance, big knits, uh, t-shirts, and to also test what we can do with, do with those kinds of clothing um, to make new things out of them. 
um, and we are really like optimal optimization. We are doing optimizations for the processes in confection, sorting, sizing. Those are really things that we are working on right now. Um, and yeah, the manual labor in the social workplaces are a good fit for that. Uh, we really want to show a new normal, enhancing the possibilities uh, with the circular uh, materials by continuing exploring and telling our, sh our stories. Um, uh, this was really, I also have really have the idea this is only the starting points and it was a very nice takeoff, but I'm super curious to explore more and, and better and bigger. Um, and by that guiding the industry towards new possibilities uh, with our knowledge and experience. I think that's about it. Thanks, Oriya. Um, I think it's best time-wise to, to bring your personal Q&A session um, uh, and, and to, to integrate it into the final Q&A so we can offer uh, Valerie uh, the time to uh, give an overview of the lessons learned and then go to the final Q&A. And we can keep that Q&A open if needed for a longer um, period of time. Okay? Perfect. So Valerie, you can, you can uh, take over the screen. Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. I'll keep it short. Um, I suppose I just wanted to highlight uh, the fact that actually, well, it's been addressed in the chat box several times. How can we change the system? Um, and with Top Atelier, we're also trying to do just that, change the system make, and make it actually easier for designers, such as the ones you've just heard about, to, uh, to produce and to also scale um, and to reach a bigger target group. Um, of course, we know that there's simply systemic issues. I mean, these are all models or, or business models that start um, at the moment something becomes waste of a value chain that has been linear all through. And so that they're basically competing with a system um, that's not really designed to accommodate for circular business models. So, so some of the challenges that we've been encountering um, relate to policy, obviously, but also related to legislation, um, to consumer awareness as well. Um, and we're trying to also tackle that with the project. We're going to do some advocacy, approaching policymakers, and just trying to make it a little bit easier for circular designers um, to break through. One of the issues, obviously, and this is all the more so now with the COVID crisis, is that this requires innovation, investment. So companies need a bit of support to start doing that, uh, whether it comes from, from, you know, from governmental grants or from investors, but there's that little push that's needed. Um, as you've seen, this is all made in Belgium, which means um, obviously the labor costs are a lot higher than if this would be made overseas. Uh, so that's an issue. Labeling um, as well, especially, and we discussed it previously for post-consumer waste. Um, most of the labels aren't actually very accurate, very reliable. And they're often not entirely true in terms of the material composition. Um, but it's also not entirely clear if you re remanufacture something what you're meant to put on a label. So what information do you need to disclose to a consumer? And importantly, once you work with a material where you're not entirely sure where it actually came from or how it was treated or, or what sort of fibers are inside, you're still liable to the consumer you sell it to. So in terms of fire safety, consumer health and so on, that can be an issue if you haven't actually received all the information uh, from production through the supply chain. Um, a wider issue, and it's also been addressed here, is that how can we really make the case for the added value of, of models as, as we've seen today, um, especially in a fast fashion market where, where customers have simply um, gotten used to rather low prices. Um, so maybe also as the European Union has been suggesting in the Circular Economy Action Plan, is there um, maybe we should put in place a sort of labeling system, you know, with a color coding, green, orange, and red something, just to highlight what the environmental impact of a garment actually is to consumers. Um, but also there's a role for industry to play, we think. Um, so actually remanufacturing or upcycling involves a lot of new collaborations uh, between the enterprises sorting uh, post-consumer waste, between those doing the cotton, cutting, uh, between the laundries and so on. So that collaboration is really only just beginning and we think there's a, a lot of exchange of, of good practices practice that needs to happen and development of, uh, of guidelines. 
Um, another issue is that nobody really knows where all the waste flows are going to. So whether that's pre-consumers, so things that were never sold, or that's post-production, that hasn't really been mapped. Uh, there is no real um, auditing from a governmental perspective, for example, in place. Um, and we heard it often, um, the designers in Top Atelier are often relying on social economy enterprises, um, but they often, yeah, they obviously operate with a different business model. Um, they're also relying on governmental subsidies and so on. So sometimes that makes it difficult for them to start innovating and also to take certain risks. Okay. Last uh, point maybe that we're obviously also thinking what could be potential solutions. So this is what, what we will be arguing for or advocating for with policymakers. Um, connect the innovators with investors so make sure to bridge those different skills between management and design. Um, again, make sure that you know, companies exchange, that they build a network, um, that they can start work together on a bigger scale. Uh, but also for governments, we've seen it now with the whole face mask issue uh, with Corona, um, start procuring differently, maybe not just look at price quality, but also look at local production, social aspects and so on. Um, maybe make uh, circular products more attractive to consumers by lowering the VAT rates. That's an idea we want to put forward. Um, and lastly, simply, it has just yeah, it needs to become more transparent where the waste is really going. France actually has a ban on the destruction of items that were not sold or items that were sold online but returned. Um, so that makes it a lot easier to also access these items since they don't go to incineration anymore. So these are a few um, elements that we're putting forward to policymakers and where we hope uh, to create some change. Thank you. Thank you, Valdi. Um... Time to go to, to the Q&A now, the general Q&A. Um, specific questions regarding to Soraya, I will pick, uh, pick them up uh, during Q&A. But one specific question uh, it really stuck into my head. Um, and it is always a question that, that reoccurs when you talk about circular economy. And it's the question about how to change the system. Valerie, well, you already mentioned uh, how to change the system is, isn't e it, it, there is no easy answer for that, but I wanted to go to my colleague Rosanna um, on, on this specific question. Um, and there was a specific question on, okay, but if all these concepts, all these innovation concepts always focus on high-end customers, um, you don't necessarily change the system and then the impact will not be sufficient. Uh, I know that Rosanna is already doing research on circular economy together with our colleague Rain Visser, who is an expert on, on systemic change. So I will give um, the word to Rosanna to, to talk about this, um, because this is a topic that always pops up time and time again when you talk about circular economy. Yeah. Um, so, of course, like you say, it is a topic that comes up with circular economy, with sustainability, with all these transitions that involved. Um, for me, what, what I think and what comes from our research is what is already said in the webinar as well, that companies, designers, they have to start somewhere and you have to start small to, to build up some traction and to build up an audience and to show that it's possible. And if it's possible for smaller companies, um, imagine what bigger companies, what a lot of money can do uh, if they put their mind to it and if they are willing to change their processes um, and if they are willing to change their business models. And that is one of the most important things because what we see from uh, bigger companies in the fashion industry is that they... Um, that they put out circular lines or sustainability lines, but in the end, their key business model keeps being a linear model. So that willingness to change and the, um, the money that is needed for that, uh, that should be put in the right direction. Um, so, yeah. Thanks. Um, maybe uh, a question for Valerie. Um, specifically on the change of the current fashion industry or textile industry. Is the textile fashion sector trying to change to circularity? And if yes, where is it now in this process? We know that in Europe, uh, we are blessed, to be honest, with the Green Deal, although there's a lot to say about that one. It is coming and it's coming fast. But Valerie, maybe you're the perfect person to answer this. 
Um, well, I, I think we've seen a lot of commitments over the past year. So industry seems very keen to sign up to lots of pledges and all that. Um, they're sort of known to systematically under deliver on those pledges and not always sort of measure the, the progress they're making. Um, but indeed, I think now all eyes are a bit on the European Commission. They'll be putting out a textile strategy next year. Um, the hope is that that will include a lot more upstream sort of design or product policy measures. Um, so really tackling how a product should be designed in an ecological way and also what substances that can actually include so that those, you know, some chemical substances like Chrome 6 was mentioned earlier, that they don't get cycled and recycled all over again in a future system. Um, so I think as long as that reg regulatory push isn't there, um, yeah, it will be a bit of a wait and see game, but uh, let's see. Thank you. Yeah, I always mention, um, if you talk about circular economy, uh, at this point, uh, yeah, it, it sounds a bit harsh, but at this point, it is a theoretical concept. Um, it is still a theoretical concept, but it is a theoretical concept of really high value. Um, and all these innovators that are trying to change um, are adding to uh, changing the theoretical concept into a practical approach. Uh, but we are at the start right now. Um, maybe if I look at the time, um, we are, um, it's 3.30 right now, so we, uh, we have to finish uh, on time, of course. But I, I want to give uh, the word to Anne um, from Top Atelier as, as project leader and, and how she sees this Top Atelier experience um, towards her uh, industrial partners, the confection industry, but also towards uh, the Flemish um, policy makers, because the idea of Top Atelier is to give insights towards the industry as well as to policymakers. Okay, so first of all, to involve the industry, you need these beautiful products who, who were uh, presented today. And uh, when you go to, with these prototypes and you explain the, the whole story of uh, Top Atelier, the ideas, and you show uh, the products and uh, with these products also the technical files who go with it, then uh, the doors go open. And um, that's why some of the uh, companies are interested to work um, on this. It's really new for them. And also uh, an important thing is the employees in these uh, companies we are working now on cutting. If they are not interested, then uh, you can't advance in this uh, project. And I mentioned before, this project takes only two years. We have to finish it uh, end of this year. But I hope we can continue afterwards with a uh, follow-up or an, an other uh, project where the industry is still involved. And um, we developed also trainings for um, the employees in the industry to train them and to be uh, aware of uh, this change. So um, I think for me, it's positive. This uh, story is positive. And even if it doesn't evolve in the way you want, because of the budget that is limited and the time that is limited, you, you see progress. You see progress through all the stories of these designers. You see progress in the industry and uh, these little steps uh, go forward. And uh, that's, uh, that's nice to see. So uh, that can be a conclusion, I think. A short answer on, on a, a clear question. Will there, will there be a next Top Atelier call if it depends on you and solely on you? What would of be course. the answer? Of course. <laughs> and I can, I can add to that that I think that uh, all partners uh, related to fashion and textile are, are starting to move and, and are going into that, that experimental zone where they are trying to understand uh, what can be of added value towards their business and towards society. Um, it will happen, but it will be a step-by-step -step approach. And there will also be a lot of experimental uh, actions that will fail. But out of that, there will also be hugely successful exactly. projects, I think. Uh, 
Um, I think officially we will close the, the session right now, but there are still like a hundred uh, attendees. So uh, we can um, take some specific questions still uh, on. And, and I would suggest giving one question towards Soraya because it's a, I will check where I put it. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really a, a question about, um, really, you can only uh, ask it to designers. Um, first of all, someone said, I found it very interesting what you said about how upcycling becomes a new source of, source of inspiration and a different way of creativity. Do you feel you are engaging in imaginative design? What do you feel is necessary to imagine design for a post-growth, post-fast fashion future? So it's really about, what do you need as a designer, the mindset, but also the skills to be able to deliver? And I would say I would give it to Soraya because I uh, stole her personal Q&A. Um, so just take the word, Soraya. It was a question with a lot of big words, but I, 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 I kind of get it. And I think it's also because normally you like design a shirt and then you, shirt, you search for the fabric and then afterwards you, you search the, the, the producer. And what we are doing here and the, all the products uh, we, we saw today, they have, um, they, they start from the materials and from the possibilities we have here and from from all the the textile that we kind of discovered and i think it i also do think that um that these streams are highly 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 uh, inspirational because that's, that's that's it's just a starting point like uh, having these materials in your hands, having them on your table, putting them, them over your shoulder, seeing what is happening, touching it, making different tests with it. It's like if you can, if you are making the material talk, then you, then you can like, it's also the imagination of the material that is speaking. It's not only you as a designer that are making something up in your head. It's, it's like the co-creation of what is existing and what you bring yourself to the table. Um, is this an answer? Yeah, definitely. This is already an answer on, on the design perspective. And I would really add one element to that on the level of entrepreneurship, um, what is needed yeah. on that one. Yeah, like on entrepreneurship, you can you can say that I can answer it in the same way. Like as an entrepreneur, I am also a designer and I'm like designing the kind of uh, a business model that I would feel good in, that I think that is sustainable towards towards the um, towards the future and knowing the um, knowing what is happening right now in this world is encouraging me to take the steps that i'm doing today and uh, is like telling me to just do more and do better and to scale this and to show the possibilities that we have because it is so necessary and i have seen that is that in industry it is so hard to to implement innovation and change within existing systems. So as a designer entrepreneur, um, you can do so much. And this is a freedom that I take and that I enjoy a lot. And what it was also discussed in the Q&A was like, yeah, this is a push and pull kind of thing. And um, consumers are really like, they are uh, in charge of everything. If a consumer is asking a certain question, it, if there's a certain demand, then the market will follow. And it's, it's about us uh, telling this story and showing these possibilities that will also um, inspire and even force bigger uh, companies to also go for a change. Is this the good uh, addition to the, <laughs> yeah, to the question. Definitely. No, I, I know your, um, your situation eh? and, and it's for all the designers, they have to balance between design and, and look for uh, inspiration, um, create something beautiful. And at the same time, you have the complex issue of finding a good financial and commercial balance, short term, long term. Um, and it, it really takes a, a, a bold mindset to combine these two approaches. But um, that is what all designers are doing right now inside of Top Atelier. Um, and it seems to be um, hard, definitely hard, but also really inspiring to combine these two approaches. 
Um, and, and that's, I think, important also an important lesson for the fashion industry itself, that, that uh, every fashion designer that wants to um, have a go on, on circular fashion um, will have to uh, switch hats and, and set up an entrepreneurial uh, hat also. Uh, how uncomfortable it may be uh, to, to switch that head, of course. Uh, and then new things can happen. And I think all the designers right now are on a path where, where new collaborations can occur, where new stakeholders can be invited, where maybe um, financial streams supporting uh, funding can, can occur because they took on that challenge to create something in that gray zone. that It was really uncertain where, to, where you were going to land. But it is, in essence, still a compromise. It isn't a perfect circular solution, but everyone tries to push it as far as possible. Um, there's one specific um, topic that I just saw on the, on the level of, of labeling. Uh, still, we can we can go on. There are still 100, I, I do, 93 participants, so that's really a lot. Still, um, normally if we go over time, it's like it drops to 30 or something. Uh, so, if wanted, we can can further discuss if that's okay for all uh, all the uh, the people here. Um, on the level of labeling, we already mentioned it a bit. Uh, labeling is a, is a, a difficult issue. Um, maybe Am, um, you can discuss this. Um, if you look at the industry and, and their current uh, production environment and their current quality control system, you really see that the cases that, that are, are developed through Top Atelier, they really um, bump into yeah, difficult complexity regarding to labeling and regarding to quality control, right? Uh, labeling is really a problem huh? because uh, we don't know um, the, our source material, it's not clear. The labeling is uh, often also not correct and maybe we don't have the labels of the source material. And also for these designers we have here, um, it's impossible to uh, bring, um, to cut a piece and to analyze it in the, in the labs to know exactly what it is. And even existing clothing um, a lot of uh, existing clothing uh, has the, the, the wrong labels. The, you have the composition label, which is, uh, must be legal in, in, this, uh, in, in your uh, finished product, but uh, often it's not the right composition who is written on your labels. So that is a big, big problem. And also for upcycling, we want, and then maybe we have to pass the word to Valerie, because uh, we are uh, attending to, uh, to uh, report, to put it in, in the report of uh, Top Atelier, uh, to make a change that we can upcycle and we can put a legal label in uh, our upcycling products. Yeah, and that's again a green deal topic, of course. Yes. I don't know where it's going to, to, to go to regarding to what the EU will, um, will come up with, but uh, maybe Valerie, you have already a bit of a, an overview on that. The Green Deal uh, speaks of a product passport um, that will be part of what they call a circular data space. Um, that will obviously be like in four or five years, not earlier. Um, but it also means probably that we will no longer have physical labels and they would be relaxing the current textile regulation, which says that your label has to be physical, it has to be attached to the garment and everything, which is also not very handy even for mechanical recycling, because then this label, which is often polyester, um, it just becomes a contaminant. So it's even for that purpose, it doesn't really, you know, it just creates problems. Um, so moving towards more digital labels and I think the, the research and the R&D is ongoing for that. Great, thank you. Uh, one specific question on um, the current economical model of the fashion industry. Um, why is it so difficult for the current economical model um, to push and implement circular measures for the textile industry? Um, anyone, I, I would, really, would be glad to answer that one, of course, um, but maybe someone else that has an opinion on this one. Rosanna, maybe? Uh, yes, but I mean, I'm also interested, interested to see what your opinion about that is. So I would say, let's go. Okay, first of all, if you talk about economical models, talk about business models of company, um, 
everyone talks about transition of these business models. But in essence, if you look at the research uh, regarding to business model innovation, you see that there are not so many companies that are able to make that transition. This is really exceptional, especially in Europe. Um, so that means that although inside of companies, you will find that a lot of individual employees are willing to, to go towards more circular, it doesn't mean that uh, a company is able to make that transition because they are stuck with their current business model and it has implications on all levels of their current business. So it is like a, a suit that they have on uh, and they cannot change it from one day to another. Um, so uh, why isn't it possible? Because it's so damn hard to change your business model and the previous business model the, the take make waste um, business model was really yeah, effective on a financial level. Uh, there was a lot of uh, money or still is a lot of money that is going on in the fast fashion industry, uh, but it doesn't, it hasn't uh, been said that uh, because there's still a lot of money going on there that lots of these companies will be able to use that money to change their business model. Rosanna, some uh, ideas and opinions on that one? Oh yeah, I agree with what uh, what you said. And in addition to that, is I think we shouldn't forget that everyone that is working in companies now is not educated to think about any sustainability related issues. I mean, some are, but the gross uh, majority of people aren't. So I think I also saw it coming by in the chat somewhere. Is that education plays a very big part in this? So even already from, from high school, primary school, um, in fashion education, in all those, those parts, sustainability, circular, circularity should be uh, integrated to make the right decisions and to know what you as a designer or even what you, what you do on a work floor, what kind of impact it has on the environment, on people uh, and on everything that you do. Yeah, and I, I already see that there's some uh some more um, discussion material here that uh, following up on transition uh, and economic models in the earth logic fashion action research plan um, there is a critique on circular fashion circularity is too much like the current model changing a part of the model closing the loop but not changing the economic model as such um, i would already say look changing a system as such is a top-down bottom-up approach and it will take years to change it. Uh, there will not be like a, an immediate switch, um, but what you see is that uh, when there is traction occurring on the market, that means new players, like say our designers, top atelier designers, enter a market and the market is, starts to move. This is um, a prediction for uh, a bigger wave of change that can occur. And to be honest, we can laugh about all small startups that are willing to fail that are taking risks, but these are the first indications that something is happening in the industry. Uh, and when some of these small cases suddenly start to, uh, to scale up, you will see that some bigger players will take risks, will try to tweak their business model, or new startups will be able to disruptively innovate the current market. These are typical economical business logics regarding to business model innovation that you see currently in almost every sector. And this is also for the fashion industry. Uh, that's no, no exception for the fashion industry. So yes, the critique is correct. The circular fashion system itself is at this point still a theoretical system and the changes that are taking place are step-by-step -step approaches. But the more changes that are happening, the more chance that this shift will speed up. And of course, the top-down approach from Europe will have uh, a huge impact, impact also on, on this change, on the, 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 the speeding up this change, I think. Uh, that was my personal um, interpretation of this topic. Um, but I have to check, Caleb. Yeah, Rosanna, just take over if you want to add something. No, it's fine. And I actually have to drop out soon. Yeah. Uh, so I think I'm going to drop out now because thank you very exactly. much for yeah. having me and for staying on so long. And I'm going to leave. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Time to, uh, to close everything. I think I'm, I'm really excited to see 
uh, how many attendees uh, are still active. Um, to be honest, we all have our personal uh, schedule of the day uh, and that's always a, uh, an issue. Um, so for now, um, we have to close. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and thanks to all the presenters for their valuable uh, inputs and, and nice presentations also. We will make uh, this webinar available through YouTube and we will see one-on-one -on -one with the designers if we can share the presentation, of course, knowing that uh, intellectual property will be discussed there also. Uh, so thank you for now and hope to see you uh, at our next webinar. So goodbye.